Five years after the credit bubble burst, I find that still very few people, it seems to me, understand where we are today and how we got here exactly. And sometimes we humans can be so minutia ridden and everything up close on our day-to-day -day pursuits that we lose sight of the big picture. So I always find it helpful for myself to take the discipline of going back up to 40,000 feet once in a while and looking down on the lay of the land. And to understand today, I think you really have to get a sense of exactly what's happened over the last 20 years in particular. So I'd like to take you through some slides today that um, show you that big picture from the 40,000 feet view. And we have an hour for this talk. Uh, that's a long time to listen to anybody. Um, so I was thinking that maybe I'll go about 50 minutes or so. And then if you have any questions, we can always do that at the end. Um, first of all, I'd like to start out with three findings, because I find that there is many lessons to be learned. And the worst thing I think you, you can do, as I tell my kids, is make a mistake and then not learn from that mistake, right? And um, so I think it's very important that we are aware of exactly what behaviors we tend to repeat as human beings. So first of all, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to show you three s slides that are some findings that came out of a two and a half year Senate committee hearing, full-fledged cross-examination of all key witnesses in Wall Street and major institutions, financial institutions, banks. And these are some key findings that came out of that very diligent uh, review that took place, as I say, over two and a half years. The first one is that excessive and unrestrained speculation dominated the securities markets and that the cost to the public has been staggering. I think that we can see that in uh, the fact that many pensions in the world, actually most pensions in the world today, are um, heavily underfunded and will have major restructuring ahead. We see that in the levels of debt, which are all over the world, in levels of government and certainly in consumer balance sheets, and that the injections that have taken place over the last few years, the trillions of dollars that have been spent, have really now come to create a huge uh, funding deficit for the real world and real world programs. So first of all, this speculative behavior was not free, it was extremely expensive, and we're now paying the price for that. The other thing is that there's a huge incentive in the participants of public markets to give the impression that uh, there's a lot of people buying. There's huge volume, huge interest. In fact, what we have today is a marketplace that's primarily driven about 80% by algo trading um, machines and people who are trying to glean pennies rather than invest. So it's quite a different landscape than many people think when they think of investment markets. And I think that it's really important to understand that just transactions alone do not indicate a robust demand or attractive valuations. In fact, that false demand can be very deceptive. As they found, it attracts the public and makes people think that they can put their savings to work. Um, and that can create a great peril for real life people. And the third thing I thought was really poignant was that the speculation in securities typically leads to an incredible speculation in commodities. And being Canadian, um, it is certainly something we have witnessed over the last 10 years in particular. And yes, all of these findings, folks, came from the 1932-34 Senate Banking and Currency Review, the Pecoria Commission, otherwise known as. So these are all things that we actually learned in the 1920s. We've learned them several times through history, but I thought that the 375-page report, if you ever care to look through it, Pecoria Commission report, uh, comes to a remarkable uh, mirror of what we've lived through. And all of the key players, including the fact that uh, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs were up for investigation and cross-examined all the heads, and they came to the conclusion in that uh, hearing that they were unscrupulous and 
not driven by ethics and had no problem taking advantage of their clients. So some things never change. Why this is important, I think, is again, to get a sense of where we've come through in the last 20 years. So first of all, everyone now recognizes the NASDAQ bubble when we look at it. Uh, people will talk about the tech crash of the 1990s, 1999-2000, as if it was um, so obvious, right? Well, obviously, there was the tech crash. But I can tell you, and any of you that remember it, People didn't think it was that obvious when it was happening back in the 1990s. The fact that the NASDAQ doubled in 1999, in one year, went from 2,500 to 5,000. People thought that was you know, just a sign of very um, fortuitous, wonderful times, where everything was going well and there was no risk. Well, actually, as we look back now, we see that that intense focus on technology created a huge overinvestment a huge misallocation of capital. So a whole bunch of systems were brought on, brought on, lines were laid you know, all around the world for fiber optic cable, for example. Things that were an intense overinvestment at that time, and yet afterwards have been the wind at the back of the social media stuff, for example, for the last 10 years. So although the stock prices crashed, although it was a horrible investment, for anybody that was trying to buy into that theme of the technological revolution in the 1990s, um, it has, in fact, provided an infrastructure which has been extremely beneficial to us over the last few years. So there's a, a misallocation, which is a, a waste of money, per se, in the short term, but it ends up providing some benefit to us over the longer term. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, because I would suggest to you that what happened with commodities over the last 12 years is very akin to what happened with tech. So you always have a thesis or a germ of an idea which is a, a, a viable investment idea. So for example, back then it was that the world was going online and that everyone needed computers and everyone wanted to access the internet. All that was absolutely true. But a good story goes wrong when it's oversold, when too many people double down and when the prices go past the stratosphere. That's exactly what I think we've seen with the commodity sector in the last few years. If you think back to 2007, I can remember being at this very show on a panel with some very bullish commodities people, which was very prominent in the investment business the last few years. Um, and they were all talking about China and India. China and India, insatiable demand, right? Meaning that prices could only go higher. There was no probability of a pullback and that this was a structural change that could never um, soften. And in fact, what you see is that that chart of the commodities index is incredibly like the tech bubble chart that we saw. So you see that over a period of, uh, over a period of 53 years, this is the commodities index from 1947. So over a period of 53 years, the prices of commodities doubled. Okay. And then, over a period of seven, they tripled. And people will say, well, Danielle, that's because the world population was growing so much. You know, we've got seven billion people, and they require an awful lot of, of materials. So that's why you saw the Commodities Index triple in seven years. And yet, I would point out to you that in the 50 years leading up to 2000, you had 137% growth in the world population and still the commodities index only doubled during that period in prices. And yet in the last 10 years, you had a 12% increase in the world population. So what's going on here? It's not just that there's more people and that they're using things. I'd suggest to you that this is where we get back to this intertwine with the investment world and this germ of a reality in terms of real demand. It became the greatest story ever sold, once again. So you see that this, for example, is an investment flow of capital going into the commodity space, whether it's ETFs, you know, hedge funds, mutual funds, um, co commodity-specific investment mandates. Again, very like what we saw with tech and telecom. Everybody wanted a tech and telecom fund until the 100% the gains went down by 80%, and then nobody wanted a tech and a telecom fund, right? Nobody. And they were horrified when they looked in their accounts and saw what they had. So I'm suggesting to you that what's really going on here is that uh, you had this 1,500% increase 
in this period of time, in this 10 years, um, of capital chasing returns and flowing into this investment story. So what happened is that the correlation between commodities and equities went to nearly one. So back at the beginning of this run, early 2000, when everyone was still in tech and telecom, no one was in commodities, right? No one had invested in commodities for a long time, 10 years. They were very underinvested. And back then, they were, they were just trading as rocks and trees, things that people used. And the correlation in terms of an investment um, connection was about 0.2. So if stocks went up, commodities didn't necessarily follow. Very weak correlation between those two. Well, what you've had in the last 10 years, because you've had all this capital, all this investment money, all this speculative money, free flowing from the credit bubble, it went into all those sectors and now everything trades together. So the idea that you could get diversity in commodities as an investment class is simply not possible in these conditions. And I think that's the reason why people were so amazed in 2007 and 8 because they had in their head that, okay, the stock market's in a secular bear and it could go down, but commodities will be a separate asset class. They will protect our capital. And that simply wasn't the case. You saw a profound collapse in most commodity prices when that bubble burst the last cycle in 2007. So now what's happened in the last five years? Well, we had this resurgence of central bank intervention, right? People trying to keep this price system pumped up. And so capital was flowing into right from the bottom in 2009, you know, the first uh, range of stimulus fiscal stimulus from many countries, as well as monetary stimulus. And so there's no question that this Fed easing, this cash, has funneled into commodities and stocks. And there's the chart, shows you. There's the Fed assets in blue and the commodities prices in red. And boy, it really was working there for a while, wasn't it? Before you got to 2011, that was a, a story that was on fire again. And people that believed in the, in the long-term bullish trend before the crash of 2009 were reinvigorated to it. They said, aha, you see, we were right. It is an upward trend that will never be stopped. And certainly, the stimulus after stimulus after stimulus has now reinvigorated the bullish sentiment in the investment community. The percentage of people that are now bullish of risk assets is at a very high level. So you see that in all the newsletter writers. Even people that were bearish, you know, a year ago, um, very negative on, on equity markets, have capitulated, I would suggest to you, a lot of them in the last six months, let's say. Particularly this last round since the LTRO was announced in Europe and Mr. Draghi said he's never going to stop pumping and then Mr. Bernanke said the same thing. And now you have a whole bunch of capitulation in people who before that were saying this makes no sense, things are overpriced, this is ridiculous, this has got to be dangerous. And now you hear them say, oh well, I guess the Fed's got, got our back. The Fed won't let the thing go down. These were the most expensive words that have ever been spoken in human history, let me tell you. Because it is absolutely untrue that central bankers can control prices indefinitely or that they can force assets up against a declining earnings scenario for very long. If they were able to do that, by the way, we would never have had all the various bear markets that we've had. We would not have had the stock markets lose 50% twice in the last 12 years as they pulled out every trick they could think up. So this idea right now is very prominent that there's a put, there's a Bernanke put or a Draghi put, there's, a, there's this insistence that markets can't go down. So there's no doubt that the money flowing into these sectors, um, certainly that shows you uh, the QE1 was the biggest one in blue there. Uh, QE2, you had some stimulation to prices in 2010, and then the green line is what we got out of the QE infinity that was announced uh, about six weeks ago. But what you see is that there's two problems with this. Number one, the money flows into commodities and spikes their prices, and that hurts the real world. In fact, that chokes off demand, which is already weakened, and makes the slowdown only worse. 
it funnels into things like copper, for example. Now, if you look at that chart of copper, you see that the business cycle top in 2007 was really awesome. Copper went from 67 in 01 to $4 at the peak of 2007. Remarkable gains were made in that particular commodity. And I would suggest to you, however, that um, the correction that we saw back to that line is actually more like the systemic demand that's in the world. The rest of it is this, as I say, financial speculation on, on money flowing about. Iron ore is a, a better indicator. It's not as sexy. It's not as widely traded as something like copper. And we see that it's had a 41% decline year over year. So my general thesis here, and I'll get into more of the particulars next, is that five years after the start of the last recession, we are presently in the next recession. And that is textbook for a secular bear deleveraging cycle. Every five years, three to five years, you tend to get another major downturn in world demand. And during that period, more and more people get wrung out of the system. More and more weak companies and managers get wrung out. And this is a process that takes about 15 to 20 years. So starting from 2000, we're now in going into year 13. So we are making some progress. I'll get to some more on that in a minute. So what we have to understand is that as the central bankers pump this liquidity in to try and revive demand, in fact, they're choking demand. You get up, up to a point where, for example, the break-even point, it shows you here, on uh, major oil producers, for them to have profitability. You know, they used to have a break-even point that was very low, but they too must consume um, the inflation in their own commodities as they try and produce things. So wage inflation in that sector, as Alberta, for example, has been very hot. You see that our cost structure goes up every time the prices are goosed further, which only knocks off the real demand. Consumption from real users goes down, just as the cost to produce go up. So now you've got a whole bunch of capital, for example, chasing things like the oil sands which make no sense on a mathematical basis. But because they've had high prices, they've had more and more people wanting to produce. Right? So you have this great dislocation between organic demand and how many people are chasing to pump more stuff at these prices. So you have a lot of speculation in this area. Uh, this is just a, an, a reflection of um, you know, the gold miners. They've not come back. They've had a very... Uh, low underperformance over the last couple of years and certainly have not kept pace with the price of the metal. And people are, are kind of amazed at that. I, I see them often saying, I don't understand, gold miners should be also going up with the price of gold. The reality is that they did. They peaked in 2007-8 with the price of everything else at the ceiling. So I think that people will see over the next little while, as the world continues into this next recession, I think that prices will all of a sudden start to go down. They have been. Junior miners have corrected an awful lot over the last year. But I think that there's still more downward pressure coming there. And what's remarkable is, even with the uh, doubling, tripling, quadrupling of prices that we saw leading from 2000 to 2007, you'll still hear a lot of people talking about how the commodities boom is, is going to peak one of these days. The commodities boom, boy, the demand's really going to kick in. Prices are really going to go off the, the charts really soon. But I think it already did. And so this is the thing. Over the last uh, 100 years or 200 years, this chart just shows the peak of the CRB, commodities uh, prices. And you see that they tend to be about a 10-year cycle, and they always come to a big um, crescendo, just as everyone in the world is pumping out those products. So think back to the tech bubble, okay? So that is actually good for the future, bad for prices presently, in terms of keeping them at these levels. This is a remarkable chart. I think this speaks more than, than just about anything else to how ineffective current monetary policy is. So that blue line is the monetary um, base that the Federal Reserve, for example, you could do this for most countries that have been trying to intervene, but the monetary base of the U.S. 
It shows that you know the, the trillions of dollars that have been added to try and f fuel liquidity supposedly into the economy has not moved through the economy at all. In fact, the more they put in now, you see the lower the velocity that's moving through. And that disconnect, I think, is going to continue here. They can add more money, but it isn't going anywhere. It isn't igniting demand. It's igniting speculation, which we're all paying for as we go along. So you see things like the transport sector, Caterpillar, for example, uh, which was on fire when everyone was mining everything and producing everything and just can't get enough of it. And now you see that even in the last few months, as the stock market has bounced back on this idea of the Fed put, you haven't had the follow through in some of these um, more, uh, more organic demand sectors and stocks and companies. So these excess, res excess reserves from QEs are just sitting, sitting in the bank balance sheets, sitting in cash, sitting on the sidelines, extremely inefficient system we've got right now. And we have the lowest money velocity. That's the money moving through the economy. Think of the multiplier effect. We have the lowest we've had that's in this chart since 1959. So we've got trillions and trillions of printing and the least amount of money moving through the economy of any time. It's quite an am amazing uh, statistic to think about. The fact is that none of this money has produced any real demand or any real jobs. And so the unemployment rate in most parts of the world is the lowest it's been since the Second World War. So obviously you need to have consumers with actual funds. So we have two problems today. Most consumers are undersaved because they've been told to spend, spend, spend. And also, interest rates are so low that those who do have money are struggling to live off their, their savings. So a million dollars in the bank today be lucky to produce you twenty dollars to $30,000 of income. Right? Think about that. Some of you are living that. But the idea that even having $10 million in the bank makes one very wealthy today. I mean, obviously that's a lot of money, but considering that you would get maybe $250,000 of income off of that is quite a remarkable statistic to think about. So the fact is that the low rates they've been trying to perpetrate to affect demand has actually just made people pull in further, has made people think they can't afford as much as they did before. Because you literally have to um, save 25% of your income in, er, in order to amass the same amount of savings when interest rates are 1% as when they're 5 So they're just effectively locking down behavior, making this switch to more frugality, just as they say they're trying to stimulate demand. So it's an end game. I think we've come as far as we're going to go. The credit bubble burst, and now people are changing their behavior. And that's actually extremely positive. But in the short run, it means that domestic growth is contracting. Um, you're not seeing the same support for all these big box stores, mega stores. You know, Rona recently announced that they're going to shift back from these $25 million mega super stores to a $500,000 budget store. The local neighborhood um, hardware store is their new idea. You're seeing that you know, in, in grocery stores. You know how in the good old days we used to go into a grocery store and just pick up some vegetables and some bread? And then everyone started being able to get clothes and, and uh, vacuums and barbecues? Well, that is now phasing out as well. They're starting to lay off a lot of people in that sector because they realize no one's spending like that anymore. People are coming in and picking up the vegetables and the bread and going home. So this is, again, it's a, it's a behavioral shift for the better because what was happening before was insane, was not sustainable, was very self-destructive, financially suicidal, is how I like to look at what we've just lived through. So now people are starting to understand that. But it does mean that you're going to see another major recession in the world because people have to pay off what they've already spent on debt. And some of that debt has to be written off completely. So you're getting this recession now in um, the global output, in manufacturing, and particularly in China, which was this poster child for insatiable demand, supposedly. But it turns out it was mostly Westerners demanding everything that was driving the growth there. They still don't have the resilience in their domestic economy. So 
you know, you're going to maybe see 5 to 7% growth rates for the next few years. And it'll get worse because that's a very aging society. So that's okay. China is no longer going to be the poster child for this idea that we can spend and consume everything on the earth. And um, what we now have, though, and this is where I get to the investment point of all this, we have a very big risk in the world for people who are being forced out onto riskier assets because of interest rates, okay? Some of you people, you know, people are being told, well, don't worry about the fact that money can only pay you 1%. One, 1 Go pick up some dividend-paying stocks because that'll make up your deficit. But the risk here to capital is quite profound because you have this, uh, as I say, ISM new orders, manufacturing data, everything falling, and that's that gray line on the bottom, at a time when you have valuations on stocks um, at some of the highest they've been except for 2000. So huge overvaluation relative to what earnings and demand is going to look like. This is the very essence of financial danger for people who are trying to use these markets to invest. This is just an interesting one because I know gold is, is certainly something that many people feel extremely bullish about today. But I always like to caution people that as Canadians, it's not the same uh, idea for us or impact for us as it is for Americans. So if you talk about our currency, you, know, you invest your Canadian dollars. The price of gold going up doesn't mean that's your return if the dollar has also appreciated. And just this chart just shows you that with all this endless printing and every reason in the world for the gold bugs to be right about gold being, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, it's still not even back to 1800. And in Canadian dollar terms, you're actually flat over the last year. So just, again, big picture down, try and keep a sense of where we're at here. The US dollar is the most hated currency in the world, perhaps, and yet, it has received inflows and continues to through all of this. Now, when you think about the US dollar index, you have to appreciate that that basket of global currencies is 56% or so the euro. So obviously, if you're looking around and you're trying to figure out where in the world is safe to put money today, and that is a good question, the idea that the eurozone is more risky or dangerous or vulnerable at this point certainly has some weight. Um, and other currencies in the world are simply not liquid and deep enough to attract the money, the amount of capital that needs to be put in financial assets. So they really only have these two choices. So the US dollar is still considered a safe haven in these conditions, and someday that may change. Indeed, if they don't rectify their fiscal problems, eventually that will probably change. But at this point, they still are seeing the inflows. That's also very relevant because it impacts commodities as the US dollar strengthens, and if it strengthens here significantly, as it did in 2008, you could see a dramatic impact on the commodity side. Again, when prices are high, risk is highest. We already know they're disconnected from organic demand in the world. Now you just need the currency to really make gains on the upside, the US dollar, and you could see horrendous declines in some of those um, base metals again. So again, just to get a sense of what's really driving the picture here. Germany and the Netherlands and countries that are the net check writers in this scenario are getting increasingly frustrated and, and um, weary of that, as anyone would, right? Any one of us that had to constantly write checks to try and support family members that wanted to spend more than they earn, your patience would be limited, right? Your charity would come to an end. So I think that that's where we're at, although they keep promising more, more uh, rescues and, and magical solutions, nothing much has come in the last year. Nothing much has come. So the Canadian dollar, I'd suggest to you, uh, may be indeed vulnerable to the downside here because I noticed that the optimism with respect to Canada has gone to just silly levels in the last year. Just really silly uh, expectations of how wheeled the couple, much like what we heard in 2007. You know, the commodity story, again, being the dominant theme. Uh, everybody in the business of selling you commodity products always telling you that don't worry because Canada is strong and fiscally we only have 36% federal debt or the lowest in the G7. That's true, but total debt in our country 
is above 350%. Because we confident Canadians have believed what everyone told us in the last few years and spent our brains out. So that means that we are vulnerable now on a domestic front because we can't all go and save ourselves anymore on lines of credit when they're already full. It means our housing uh, prices probably have to come down. Those cycles tend to be 12 years. We've been more than 15 in this up cycle. So those prices coming down and uh, you're likely to see uh, that reflected in the Canadian dollar. So if we could get a weaker Canadian dollar, it would actually be supportive for our exports again. It would be part of the healing process as prices come down. But um, in the meantime, you know, I thought it was interesting with the QE in infinity in the last month, uh, you saw huge volatility in the Canadian dollar, particularly last week. And I think that may indeed continue. Just keep in mind that it dropped about 22% in 2008 as against the US dollar. So another way Canadians can make what I consider to be less risky gains in this type of environment is to have some allocation to the US dollar. You don't have to buy US equities with it. You can just buy some US dollars with a portion of your uh, savings. And it'll be one of the few things that typically goes up when everything else in your portfolio may be going down. Just something, again, in this world where there's very few negative correlations, where everything pretty much moves together, it's helpful to know what things won't typically go down with the rest. Cash is one of them, and the US dollar is another one that's typically provided some benefit. So let's get more to what I consider to be the gifts of this bubble. Now that we've long, gone through this process, made all the horrible mistakes, deregulated everything that was meaningful, took away Glass-Steagall, you know, Bill Clinton with a big smile in 1999 was the final straw and everything went back to a mosh pit free for all. Um, and so now we're cleaning up all that. It's going to take a while longer. But some of the gifts that are left over are things like incredible oversupply in transportation. You have a world that's now got enough tankers to float pretty much everything for the galaxy. And that means we'll have cheaper transportation costs as we go forward here. So that's good. Lower cost b benefit when you have a lower demand, lower revenue. But if you can get the cost down, that's also supportive. So one of the, the things, this is the Baltic Dry Index, just showing that we've got this incredible uh, plummet in the price of shipping in the world. Not so good if you're a shipper with a lot of expensive uh, boats that you've bought on credit. Good if you're a person who's trying to consume goods and wants to pay less. So that's one of the benefits. The other thing is that we have a huge push for oil independence in the United States. Now, not so good for Canada, but we are part of the North American picture. So I would suggest over the next 10 years, there'll still be demand for what we um, pump out of the ground, but it'll be diminishing. The, the U.S., the high, that $147 a barrel oil price, all that incentive to overinvest in that space in the last few years has meant that they now time, are drilling five times more than they were just uh, back 10 years ago. Um, tons of, of alternatives and uh, producers of all kinds, at the same time as Americans have become more frugal. You know, they're not driving as much. They're trying to, best-selling car, someone was telling me today, in California right now is the Prius. So people are very focused on using less, spending less. So that will be uh, a, a, a support to lower energy prices as we go forward. Again, that'll help, right? If you have less money to spend, the less you spend on energy, the better. Uh, the other huge gift that came from this overinvestment was natural gas. Nobody really wanted it. It just came from the process of, of finding the oil that we were bringing out of the ground. But the fact is that we now have huge reserves of natural gas, in certainly in North America. And the US is the largest producer and consumer of that. And I think that'll continue as they move towards this idea of self-sufficiency. And the energy self-sufficiency movement will be a huge plus in filling the hole in the US budget. They spend so many billions overseas at the moment on credit, basically, to provide their, their energy. When they start getting more of that produced in-house, it's just like a family. If you start doing your own grass and cleaning your own house, you save more of your money in your family. That's what's going to be happening as we go along here. And that will help 
turn the tide on the huge deficits uh, that are accumulating at the moment. The other gift of this bubble was this huge overinvestment in real estate. So housing, supply, mini marts and mini malls and every kind of store you can imagine. As I say, all these, every time I'm driving down the highway, I see Lowe's and Home Depot and Rona and you know, uh, whole stores of lamps, like football fields of stores that sell lamps or bathroom things. I don't know, we're gonna have to figure out what else to do in this space because no one's gonna be consuming at that level as we go forward, not on the masses, right? And the really wealthy people tend to not go to those stores. They tend to go to the more boutique -y places, right? So there's a lot of capacity there. And we'll have to maybe turn them into indoor organic farming units or something. I don't know, solar panels on the roof. Something productive, you know, because nobody wants all that stuff anymore. So we maybe make them into multi-unit housing or something. I'm trying to think because it's just like, I have this vision of ghost towns, you know, like you're going to be driving by all these buildings kind of with for lease signs on them. And clearly we aren't going to want them for consumer goods for probably another 20 years till we get back to the next credit bubble. So that's good in the sense that there's a lot of stuff built. It's the infrastructure of our credit bubble, if you will, the things that are left over for us to use now. The other thing that's making some progress is certainly in the United States at least, you know, they were at a peak of 370% debt to GDP and they're now down to about 340. So it's going in the right direction. And yes, it's a slow, painful process. It doesn't happen quickly, but they are working down the debt either by paying it off by going bankrupt, by writing it down, uh, various things, but we're off peak in terms of credit consumption and that is positive and deflationary. The only way this could be inflationary is if you continue to have a lot of money moving through the system in terms of actual consumption, in terms of people continuing to, to buy on, on that money and it's not happening. So that's a good thing because lower prices will again be helpful. Housing prices in the United States have made a lot of progress in a lot of areas, and that's attractive, again, for, for many people. I'm not suggesting they've bottomed necessarily or that they can't go down further, but if you compare what we can buy in Toronto or Vancouver or anywhere in Ontario basically today relative to what you can buy in, in the States in many of the places, uh, our housing is dramatically overvalued relative to that. So we have, on the one hand, they're making progress in the U.S. That's good because we're a feeder fish of the United States. On the other hand, Canada hasn't made as much progress yet. We still do have to uh, suffer through some of the downside that's coming. And that's just that chart showing you that uh, total credit in Canada has been going the wrong direction in the last couple of years. That means that this particular recession is likely to hit people harder than it did in 2008. They're less prepared if you look at it that way. Another good thing that's come, you know, good thing from a big, big picture perspective is that there's no wage inflation in general in many areas. Because people have become focused again on humility, on what can I do, can I get a job, can I, can I dig that hole, can I, what can I do that's going to give me a few dollars. And although it's a humbling experience, on the other side of it, it's the opposite of the entitlement era, right? So we have to get more competitive. We have to be able to uh, reinvent our workforce in many ways. And the demographics of, of you know, 60-somethings continuing to work into their late 70s because they still have debt um, will bring to this, this huge uh, wave of continued disinflation in uh, wages, young people and old people wanting to work. This means it'll focus our mind on not so much about entitlements and much more practical things. Un U.S. union membership, I thought this was interesting. This is not in the government sector, which has huge cuts ahead of it, but in the uh, private sector. We had this level of uh, low level of union me membership participation in, after the, uh, the, in the Great Depression. So we've come back to you know, at the peak in 1929, there was an enormous amount of unions and demands and entitlements. And over, pro over the process, the grinding down, you know, they start to abandon their demands and start trying to just get work of any kind. 
And I'm not saying, I'm not certainly saying that's great and I'm so happy people are making less, but on the other hand, it's a restarting, a rebooting, a recalibrating we need to come to. And so it makes us more um, competitive. And I think another amazing thing that's starting to happen and I believe will continue over the next while is you're seeing big companies bring jobs back, partly because of the problems and um, social unrest in many parts of the world, but also because now you've got things like land much less expensive in the United States. You know, you have workers who are ready and eager to go and not, not as many uh, uh, costs built into that wage pressure. So that is starting to go the right way as well. That brings us to this next idea, which is that you're having a reverse globalization almost these days. And I think this is a trend we're going to see for the next few years. Again, if you go back to different crisis periods in history, it's very common for people to pull in, you know, protect their own instead of sharing with everybody else. Now, economists will tell you that protectionism is a nightmare because it stifles global trade. But in this new world, the one I'm describing that's not f fueled just by credit, but actually requires savings in order to do things, in that world, it matters how much you waste on other people and other places. And there's a focus to try and just recycle cash in your own community. So I think this localization, localism, is going to be um, prevalent. This just, uh, there was a, uh, there's a, about a thousand currencies in Euro, the euro area today which are not the euro, which are local currencies. Bristol, England came out with one a couple of weeks ago called the Bristol Pound. And it's literally, if you work in the community of Bristol, you get paid your wages in Bristol pounds and you can take them to the butcher who will take Bristol pounds and he'll take them up the street to the baker who will take Bristol pounds. So this is an example of this idea of people saying, okay, well, we don't have very much, so we need to all work together. And we can't afford to give the money to somebody else. We have to keep it in our own community. So this is a complete shift away from you know, 10 years ago when it was all about the global village, globalization and, you know, we didn't want the, the tough jobs and get people in poorer countries to do them and we can buy everything on credit. This is an about, about face of that, which I'd suggest to you is also positive. Painful perhaps in the, in the short run. Only painful because it requires, it'll, it'll equate to less uh, GDP, less, less output, less uh, sales for each country. But the nub of it is that you can survive in a lower demand, lower growth environment as long as you don't have a lot of debt, as long as you're efficient with the resources that you have. Right? So as people understand that, they start scaling down and figuring what they can cut out, and then they get to a new equilibrium, which doesn't require them to run a deficit. That's where we're, we're headed, and that will be a healing process. So. The other good thing about this, I mean, I started understanding about secular bear markets in the late 90s, just as it was about to hit the fan. And um, I remember feeling pretty overwhelmed at that time because, you know, we were heading into, it seemed to us, uh, a completely different environment than everyone was used to in the 80s and 90s. And that this new environment would be much tougher slogging, much harder to make money as an investment person, you know, much harder to keep money, to not have it go through these horrible cycles of decline and loss. Um, and it, I was just, in general, pretty anxious about what seemed to be coming based on all the historical precedents. So I'm quite happy to say that we're now 13 years through this god-awful mess. Um, I consider that progress because historically, we probably have another three to seven years at the most before we've reversed these trends, before people built their savings rates back up above 10%, before debt to GDP ratios are much you know, lower than 70%. Um, so it, it's a process, but we are making some progress and it's nice. It's kind of like childbirth, you know it's coming, you just want to get through it, right? Well, this is kind of like a secular bear. You know, you know what you're in for, let's just get on with it. And we are in, in many ways. Um, the progress towards capitulation is partly individual investors turning their back on disgust on the investment business. And we're, we're getting there, right? We've seen inflows out of typical investment products, mutual funds, um, many uh, managed you know, things where people charge layered fees, et cetera. You're seeing a lot, of, a lot of flows out of that in the last few years. That's also a good thing because the industry was just 
taking far too much a share and providing no real benefit, no real risk management, just salesmanship, right? And taking huge bucks for that. So the capitulation that you see in a secular bear market is by the end of it, the individual investor is not even in the market. And the sad part is that if they don't protect their capital and they suffer loss after loss, they leave in disgust just as valuations are getting to be the most attractive in 20 years. So it, this is a process where you need to exercise personal restraint, protect your nest egg in every rational way you can, um, work longer instead of trying to force your savings to provide you with more, you know, spend less, lower your standard of living if you can to a point where you're able to come back into equilibrium with your earnings from your capital or from your employment. That's how you get through a secular bear market. You don't get through it by taking wild, reckless risk with the crazy people, right? Because they're mostly crazy people out there in, in these markets in particular. Um, so this is part of a process. And uh, again, we've made some, some our way through it. Um, Chinese stocks, this just speaks to my, my thesis about you know, the credit bubble being the peak of the commodity cycle, being the peak of demand in the world. Um, in 2000, and, and uh, you see that huge spike in the Shanghai Composite to 6,000 uh, in uh, 2006, and then a drop of 70%. This might as well be a, price, a chart of the price of oil or many of the other base metals, right? Everything dropping, then reinflating of late with this idea that QEs are the solution, that more government money will somehow revive demand, and now we're seeing that next leg down. So I think the 09 bottom uh, is potentially in the cards here. That would be typical, again, of a secular bear cycle, where you get this ramp up in the expansion phase, and then a recession and a drop in equity prices and commodity prices that comes back to test the long-term trend. We've had that twice now, and I think we're in the midst of the third one around about now. So you see that in the Canadian Venture Exchange. Same thing, you know, we're now that blue line you know, at the armpit, if you will, of this head and shoulder. And yeah, it's possible that if they keep, you know, pumping in some more capital, perhaps they'll get prices, animal spirits reinvigorated. Prices will go up, that'll hurt the economies more, right? Demand will fall more. So um, it's more likely that they won't be able to resuscitate prices significantly from here because this weight of the glowing demand cycle is so great. The gravity of that is like a black hole. Right? The, the credit bubble bursts and the weight of it just sucks everything down in the, in the aftermath. That's where we are. Um, and that's why I think that we may see some further decline in the Canadian um, junior miners and, and uh, very resort companies. In fact, I would suggest to you that like in the tech wreck, you may in fact see that three, four, five years from now, 70 to 80 percent of the companies in this space are no more. So think about that when you're trying to pick your way through investment ideas in this space. You know, stronger players that have lots of cash and have low break-even points will be the ones that are most equipped to make their way through this. And then to, to gobble up whatever assets are decent off of the people that are failing. But there'll be a lot of companies failing because there was a lot of people that were in the business flailing away with lots of capital but didn't actually have a lot of discipline or know-how. So this purging process is a natural one. It's how capitalism works. The weak players are taken out, and that restores some equilibrium again. So for the Canadian stock market, this is the broader composite. It's vulnerable to the downside for all the reasons that I've expressed to you, being our commodity-centric focus, being our domestic economy over-indebted, um, being the, the secular waves that are going through the world economy and how the stock market tends to follow in each recession during this period. So again, I would suggest to you, you know, keep in mind the big picture where we went in 2009. You know, something, there's various support levels here, but 11,000 is pretty key in this thesis. We're about 1,000 points or so above that at the moment. Um, and you know, all the hot money that has flown into, come into Canada on speculative fervor in the last few years, Canadians who are invested in these markets think they're invested with people like themselves. They're not. 70 to 80% of the people that are in these markets are either just hot capital trying to make a buck on a day-to-day -day basis, 
or it's international capital that's hoping that we'll decouple from the global demand story somehow here. Because Mark Carney's a nice guy and he talks well when he goes overseas and people have some confidence in Canada, but it's an unrealistic confidence if they expect us to decouple from the global economy. So um, Canadian banks, I think, are also at risk here, and this is what really worries me, is that so many people have been hoarded into Canadian dividend-paying stocks, balanced funds, they used to call them. Now they call them hybrids. Every cycle they come up with a different word. It just means that half the money will drop and the other half will be in bonds and hopefully not. That's what a hybrid approach is. So bonds have been receiving a lot of inflows. They pay some income. They're not a bad thing, but you have to be careful of the price. And the equity side, a dividend is not going to help you if we're getting into a downturn like we saw in 07, 08, or in 2001, 02. So just be very careful. If you're holding something for 3% dividend income, and your trade-off is a potential 20 to 25% drop in the capital, that sets you back years. You're not getting anywhere. You're looking busy, but you're getting nowhere. Um, the new global growth range is likely to be something like 3%, and that would be pretty typical and normal. Um, we, we had it up to 5% at the peak of the credit bubble. That's how much demand was in the world. That's a ton more than we have now. So um, again, not a no growth world. Humans are alive, we consume, we need things. Not no growth, but realistic growth. And that has to be reflected in stock prices and earnings numbers. Everything, the analyst community, my brethren, are notoriously over uh, optimistic and are still to, to this day expecting double digit earnings growth because that's just, they're wired to expect better and better and better until it blows up and then they say it was some um, unknowable circumstance that happened and it wasn't their fault. So um, this is just to show you that everyone's very, a lot of people are bearish on bonds, but in fairness, a lot of people in the industry are always bearish on bonds because bonds are a low paying uh, product. Much less hope embedded in bond portfolios, bond ETFs. They can't charge as much to manage that. So they're not as excited about that. But the reality is that until we get through this deflationary phase, so you've got the, the federal um, banks of the world pumping in liquidity, trying to be inflationary, but you have, as I say, the black hole weight of the credit bubble, the excess demand, uh, sorry, excess supply, the, the behavioral shift in consumers, um, low rates, all these things are deflationary. So, that so far, deflation continues to win this fight. And I think it will continue to win the fight for a few more years as we sop up all this excess supply and capacity in the world. And then potentially we could get to a point where it starts to become an inflation risk. But this is a chart of the 10-year Treasury yield, and we aren't there yet. So far, it continues to be in a, in a decline. And I'm not saying you can buy bonds today and don't worry about them. I worry about them because they're overpriced in many cases. But um, if you have some uh, you know, GICs or something you can buy today with no price risk, they're not trading in the marketplace. People say, well, they only pay me 1.4 or 5%. Yes, but if you don't have any methodology to buy and sell, to know when to be in and out and with what portion of your capital, you're better off to just do that in the short run for the next year or two till some of this next phase is played out than to chase after dividend paying stuff in the hope that you can keep spending the same level. So this is a chart of what dividend stocks did in the last downturn. Uh, the Canadian dividend index, um, they're all the same. They dropped 45% relative to the S&P losing 55. So that's no help to anyone in the real world, okay? Most people in the investment business, this is their great idea today. You know, people should have dividend paying stocks. I throw my socks at the TV in the morning when I hear them on there. So anyways, um, post credit bubble, this is the new world, okay? Hyper demand was caused by the credit bubble. We're not in hyper demand anymore. It's actually a good thing. It was a very unhealthy condition. However, you have to deal with the terms of this new, um, this new world. Lower discretionary spending. You're going to have less government revenue to go into all kinds of programs. Everything's going to have to have some restructuring. Right? You can't insist on our own way when there's not money to pay for it and the line of credit is not going up anymore. 
So higher spending on gray issues, obviously, you've got this um, demographic going on in the world where 10,000 people, just in the United States alone, 10,000 people are turning 65 every day right now. And that will continue for the next 18 years till this 78 million boomers moves through the population. So that's a theme that is going to be putting old and young sort of in conflict with each other, right? The old people think we've earned it, we deserve it, and the young people are broke. So we're gonna have to come to the middle somewhere uh, in terms of expectations. Immediate aid of approach instead of political or ideological. And moderate demand likely for commodities over the next couple of years as we work through the oversupply and overcapacity. So, Maintaining key liquidity is key to survival. Cash is not a four-letter word. Okay? Just because everybody in the world wants to sell you investments and doesn't want you to hold any cash, don't listen to them. Deflationary environment, you could make nothing on your money for two years and you'd still be able to buy things much cheaper a couple of years later. That's, that's a gain. That's actually a benefit. Um, and don't expect these commodity funds and ETFs and all these products which are widely sold at the moment to decouple from this environment or to provide you with any correlation benefit. Um, what you'd be better off to do is to make a list of things that you would like to own. If you have the discipline to do this, you know, how much of your account would you like to have in various asset classes and then in what kind of products. But you have to come up with a sense of where fair value is and you have to make yourself a buy rule and a sell rule if you're going to do that. If you don't have that rules all worked out, if you don't have someone who's able to do that for you, you'd be better off just to stay out of it for a while here. Let this process happen. It doesn't have to hurt you. And um, it's not a dark story. It's actually positive um, in the sense that you'll be better equipped to profit from it if you're proactive in dealing with it now. Um, so try and remember how you felt in 08 and see if you think you've changed your strategy significantly since then. Because the next downturn is unlikely to bounce back quite as quickly because we're unlikely to have as much um, stimulus money to throw at it. Both because political appetite is now diminished for that and because it's been proven to be a farce repeatedly. Ben Bernanke and company may try it a couple more times. Japan's on QE. 10,000 or something by now, and it's just, it doesn't work. It's a textbook idea. They were desperate, they tried it, but now we're gonna have to go back to just plain old hard work and, and saving our money. So anyways, uh, that's it, and thank you very much for uh, listening.